Okay, so thanks uh, people for coming to, uh, to the room uh, for my presentation. I know there's lots of other cool things to see at the moment. Um, I'm happy to see that at least some people decided that this was the, the thing to go and see, or otherwise you were too, uh, too lazy to stand up and go, go somewhere else. But anyway, my name is Steve Hardy. Um, I've been a lead developer at Serafa for quite a few, uh, or forever actually. So as long as Serafa is around, uh, I've been the lead developer there. Um, what I wanted to do today is, um, is uh, an introduction plus some in-depth technical stuff. Uh, I realize that there's probably quite a lot of people here which, who haven't really ever seen Zorafa at all or don't even know what it is. So uh, I'm going to give some high-level introduction first and then try to go a little deeper into, into everything. Uh, you can see my email there. You can try sending me an email there and see if I reply, but it may just go into DevNull. Uh, also, I'm on IRCNet. If you have any questions, you can uh, see if you can find me on IRC. So, um, a lot of people may be asking, uh, who are these uh, Zarafa guys? Where did they come from? Well, actually, we're from uh, Delft in the Netherlands. And although my name is Steve Hardy, which sounds rather English, um, well, that's because I am. Um, but actually, I was uh, born in the Netherlands, so, uh, and I also, also work there. Um, we're basically a company, and uh, we started the Zarafa product uh, a little while ago. Um, so then is the question, why, is, why are we now at FOSDEM for the first time? Well, basically the reason is, is that we've only just open sourced the product since September 2008. So that's uh, half a year ago now. And that's the reason why we're here now for the first time talking to you about, uh, about Zarafa. It's actually, it's a small mistake there, it's actually a GPL, which is a, a slight variation at GPL. And there are some parts of Zarafa software which are currently not open sourced yet. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that. We will hope to do that in the future, but currently, financially, that, that's not really a handy thing to do for the company. So um, I'll tell you which parts are open source and which are not. Basically, everything I'm talking about is all open source components. So why did, uh, why did Serafa make this product? Well, we've, uh, uh, we've been doing the product from, from, since 2005, and we had a lot of mappy knowledge, and that's a word that I'll be talking about a lot today. Uh, we had a lot of mappy knowledge in the company, and at some point we, th we thought it would be a good idea. There's currently no real collaboration server on the market um, that really can really replace an, uh, Microsoft Exchange server and really do the same things that a Microsoft Exchange server can do as well. And then I'm not only talking about um, the standard stuff that you, that you know that you can do with Exchange, like emailing and using their web access, uh, but also uh, really supporting their APIs and supporting, uh, uh, for example, mobile devices and things like that. So that's the main reason why we started the product. And then a couple of you may be asking already, what is MAPI? Well, one really important thing that I'll just start, start saying, it's not IMAP. Although they're the four, same four letters, it's something completely different. Um, I will talk about it later uh, in the more technical part. Um, but just try to remember that MAPI and IMAP are not the same. If there's any dyslectic people, um, yeah, hard luck. So, um, I've seen a lot of presentations here today. There were lots of text. I thought it was a good idea just to go through the product um, by making lots of screenshots of stuff, um, just to give you an idea of what the product is. Now, this is just Firefox, our screenshot of our webmail. And you can already see directly that it has a lot of um, uh, uh, similarities to what you'd be, uh, what you'd be using in, uh, in Microsoft Outlook with, uh, with the, uh, the, the, the folders on the left and the, uh, and the emails uh, at the top, you can also set it up to, to a different view so that it looks even more like that. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, a lot of users um, that were trying to get to open source software currently use Outlook, and they would like to use something that looks and feels like their Outlook product. So we try to uh, uh, model stuff around, around that, uh, around that uh, at least that user interface. So this is all Ajax. It has. Um, uh, of course, an HTML editor for email, but it also has all these cool context menus, so you can right-click on an email and set a little flag on it, uh, clear the flag, do options. Um, it's a real, it really feels like a real application, as IX applications normally do, of course. 
So that's, that's one part. Then, of course, in the whole web access is also integrated is all your calendaring. Um, so this is just a little qu quick screenshot of a, of a little can cal calendar that I made with some test data in it. Um, also in there is your contacts. Uh, you can do uh, uh, drag and drop things from uh, one folder to the other. I'll give you a quick demonstration uh, in a minute. But mainly, the main point is we, we took everything together and put all the, uh, all the collaboration features that you normally May, be, may have split between different uh, applications into one web interface here. So this is just a web interface. Um, we also support, of course, all your IMAP and POP3 uh, uh, clients as well. This is just the Thunderbird, looking at the same data, actually. Um, we have an IMAP POP3 gateway. I'll tell you why it's actually called a date gateway later, but it basically means that you can just use your standard POP3 IMAP clients with, uh, with the same uh, uh, data. Next screenshot, we have support, because of this whole MAPI model that we're using, we don't only support the Microsoft ActiveSync thing on your pocket PC, which probably nobody has here, I guess. Um, we also support the BlackBerry stuff through their BlackBerry Enterprise Server, also a very expensive thing to have, but the only really wa real way to synchronize your, uh, your BlackBerry is through their best server. Um, and that works with Serafa, also because of the MAPI support. And the iPhone has basically um, and uh, basically uh, the same synchronization system as the, uh, the MS Mobile. So we, uh, we support that as well. We got that one for free uh, since that they implemented the same protocol that we already supported anyway. So we have all those three as well. There's not a lot of uh, packages out there at the moment that, that can actually do this uh, that are open source. Um, we also have Sunbird support. Uh, I've got a really boring screenshot here with no data in it because I didn't have the server at the moment that I made the screenshots, which was yesterday. But anyway, we have support for CalDAV, which means that you can uh, access your calendaring data also through Sunbird or, uh, or some, other, uh, some other program on the Mac, even with I, uh, iCal, I think it's called. Then this is... Uh, yeah, a little bit different, of course, and maybe something that a lot of people don't like to see at this, uh, at this conference. Uh, this is Microsoft Outlook 2007. Um, we do support this as well, but if you want this, this is the, the, the non-open source part. So the, the Microsoft Outlook support is actually not in the open source product um, because you need to install something onto your, your Windows machine. So the entire server-side stack and everything that you run in Linux is all GPL. Uh, the only part that isn't is actually this. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of people uh, who want to be able to run a Linux server and still be able to use Outlook in a way that you'd normally do with Exchange. Uh, the, if you get the open source server, so you install the, only the AGPL v3 version uh, at your company, yeah. and you purchase the Outlook snapping thing yeah. for Windows, will that work, or do you have to purchase the Non -open source it's a good question. The question is, uh, can I run the AGPL version on the server and then still use the, uh, the, the, the commercial product on Windows? And the answer is yes there, actually. I'll just make a quick drawing here. Uh, basically, you've got your, uh, your server core here, um, which is our MAPI server core for, uh, for Zarafa. And uh, that is exactly the same whether you're using it in a, in a, a commercial environment or in an in a, a AGPL environment. This thing is just binary, it's the same thing you download. Uh, then on the Windows client, obviously, is our MAPI client. Um, and this part you just installed. This is just an MSI installer, and it works with the server. One thing, though, because it's licensed, uh, we didn't want to bother all our users with having to um, put in their license registration code here. So we've made a little, little part on the server, which is just a little license server, um, which communicates with this one so that you don't have to distribute your licenses to all your clients. But in, 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 in the whole big picture, it's basically just a direct connection between these two. So. Yeah, that's uh, also a good question. I think we're going to do lots of questions <laughs> before getting to the next slide. Um, uh, the question was, so the MAPI server is not a standard MAPI server. The problem is that MAPI, there is no map, standard MAPI server because this is a protocol which you are free to implement as a MAPI provider because MAPI is actually an API. So there's actually a little bit of software here which provides the API to Outlook. And then this is our protocol, which is a SOAP-based protocol. 
So it's not wire compatible with Exchange. Okay. So if I had another, if I had a different Mappy um, client, I wouldn't be able to use the server. Yes. Uh, sorry, last question was, so if I have a different Mappy client, then I can't use the server? And the answer is yes, because the protocol is just our protocol. I'll come back to some stuff that looks a little bit like that as well. So some other screenshots. Yeah, I made some screen dumps of putty. Yeah, it looks a bit strange, but um, uh, just to, to give an idea of user management, we have lots of command line tools, uh, one of which is the, the easiest one I just put at the top, which is just creating a user. Uh, there's just a command line tool, so rough admin, you can create a user with minus C, you just create a new user with a password, and there's your user. Um, same with delivering email. Um, an important thing to remember is that Zarafa is actually the storage system itself. So your email is stored in Zarafa. Zarafa is not just a, a layer or a web access on top of an existing storage system. Your email is actually in Zarafa. So when you're delivering an email, you also have to use our delivery agent to actually get that email into uh, the database, into that Mappy database. So that's the, the Zarafa D agent. I'll, I'll show you a little demo of that in a, in a minute as well. Then um, we also have the uh, possibility to use uh, an LDAP server. So um, uh, you can use, for example, I have a little open LDAP setup, and you can get your users from there. That's a configurable uh, backend. So you can choose I can, either I'm going to use a command line adding user system, or I'm going to use an LDAP server. You can even use your Active Directory if you really have to. Um, and that's actually the picture on the right. I couldn't find a screenshot of Active Directory, so I just put something large and heavy which is, yeah, the Active Directory side. Then, lots of stuff that was pretty hard to screenshot. Um, we've got brick level backup. Um, yeah, that's kind of a buzzword. It basically means that when you do a backup and I want to restore one single email, you can restore just that email. Uh, we've got on this compressed attachment storage, and they're even single instance. So when I send an email to a thousand people with one megabyte attachment, it's only stored once on your disk. Uh, we've got single sign-on, um, if you have single sign-on uh, capability in your network. Uh, we've got a large comprehensive security model, so uh, you can set up security per folder uh, for users and groups and grants and denies and things like that. We've got performance statistics gathering, so you can do lots of performance uh, measurements, and you may say, is performance interesting for this kind of systems? Well, yes, because we run uh, setups with more than a thousand uh, concurrent users on, on a single server and databases of up to 200 gigabytes. And this is in MySQL, by the way. So yes, performance is very interesting in this, uh, in this product. And um, you can get some statistics from there. Uh, we've got some uh, PAM-based user import. So what I was saying before, that you can create your users from the uh, command line. You can also import them from LDAP. But you can also just import them from your Unix password, uh, password file or PAM, what, uh, whatever PAM module you're using at that moment. We've got some migration tools, and uh, um, for people who know what it is, the free busy information so that you can see when people are, are busy and when they're free. So those were a bit hard to screenshot, so uh, I just listed those. So then, is, is, is Zarafa just another one of those web accesses that looks really cool? Well, I've tried to say it before already, but Zarafa really isn't just a web access system. It's really um, a core storage engine. And that's really the core of the, uh, of the system. It's all programmed in C++. Um, it's usable for hosters, for example, if you want to run a single server and you have 200 customers, and each of those 200 customers has uh, customers of their own. Uh, you can run those all on the same server without them being able to see each other and things like that. You can configure that from the LDAP server, so you can have a huge LDAP tree with, say, 200 different organizations, and they'll never know that they're actually running on the same server. Uh, we've got soon clustering support, and that means basically that you run more than one server for the same uh, setup. Um, we've got lots of programming interfaces. The most important one, which I've been talking about, is the MAPI C++ interface. And to come back to the guy who left question, or maybe it was yours, <laughs> um, uh, this client here, which is in Windows, is actually also on the server. It's the same client. We basically cross-compile this client on Windows and on Linux, only we just simply don't uh, open source the whole build environment for, your, for, for the Windows client. Why is that? Um, it's quite easy, really, since I just said that this client is the one 
uh, providing the MAPI interface, we want to be able to use that MAPI interface also on the server itself. So when I'm delivering an email on the server, I want to use this MAPI interface as well. So I want it here on the server so that I can use MAPI on the server. So everything in the entire Zorafa setup is MAPI based. So then we made uh, a language wrapper for PHP so that from PHP you can basically access the API and we made a language wrapper for Perl but that's actually only in the, in the source distribution at the moment. Then because we have all the data in our own database, if you just see that in this drawing here, I have a big database here, and uh, all the data is in there, uh, that means that when I want to retrieve my email back to my uh, uh, POP3 or IMAP4 client, that means that I'm gonna have to take it out of the database through the server and back to the client. Um, that also means, and I'll show you in a minute why that's not that easy, it means that we have to reconstruct the email because we write it into the database as a MAPI object, and which is all split up into lots of little, little bits. And the IMAP client wants the RFC 822 message again, so we have to reconstruct the message. So that's why that's not such a logical thing that we have it. The IMAP, uh, the IMAP 4 and POP3 gateway, it actually does conversion, and obviously we have SMTP support for, uh, for sending email. And as I said before, we have CalDev and iCalendar for, uh, for your calendaring needs. So here's a little stack overview, uh, MySQL over here. Uh, we use uh, InnoDB for all our uh, uh, database stuff, so it's all transacted. It's highly optimized, we've done a lot of work there, uh, also with MySQL to get that really, really blazingly fast. Um, Zorafa Server is the only one, this is one process, um, and Zorafa Server is the only one that actually connects with the MySQL database. So all the data in the MySQL database has to go through Zorafa Server, it goes through a SOAP protocol into MAPI itself, and then we have all the components on the top there. So everything that we make is either in the Zorafa server optimizing more MAPI stuff, or it's a new module on top of MAPI here somewhere. So some of the things, the D agent on the left that you can see is called by Postfix to deliver emails. Uh, the web access itself works through MAPI. Uh, the backup system works through uh, MAPI. The CalDAV server works through MAPI. And whatever your app is that you want to use that uses MAPI as well can also um, access the data through the same uh, database. Um, the BlackBerry Enterprise Server, by the way, is also just another block on this uh, list. So, as I said before, our data transport is through SOAP. Actually, before we go there, I'm just going to give you a quick idea of the um, of the of the system. I've I've got a VMware run, running here with uh, uh, with Rafa set up on it. I'll just make it a little viewable for you. I think it's probably a little too small. Now we have uh, uh, the delivery agent, which is the uh, the system. As I said before, is the uh, um, the way that you deliver something into somebody's inbox. Normally, that is just called by Postfix. So Postfix has an email and uh, basically just starts up the delivery agent and puts an email in your inbox. I'll just show you what that looks like. I have to start it from my uh, tree. I don't have an actual install here, it's just a debug. Uh. Um, so normally you start it, it started up. Um, one of the parameters is probably a little too low at the moment, isn't it? Uh, you start it up with a parameter is the username. Uh, I've got a user, user 999. Um, that didn't work, sorry about that to fix the path there. Um, now it's just waiting for my input for the email. Normally now the entire my message is pumped into here, but I'll just do a little, little test email. For example, hello world. And we'll put it in there. And as soon as the, uh, there's an uh, end of file there, you actually see that Outlook already pops up with, uh, hey, you've got a new email. And when I go to, uh, uh, to the web access, and unfortunately that doesn't refresh real time, it only does it once a minute. But here's the, uh, here's the email. I didn't put all the other fields in, so uh, you can't see the rest of the email. But that's, that's basically what you have to do if you want to um, uh, use Serafa inside your existing SMTP mail server. That's all you have to do. Um, now, of course, that's for incoming email. Then for outgoing email, it's basically the same story. We have a spooler, which is normally running all the time, and it's just looking at everybody's outbox. And as soon as there's an email there, it sends that from your outbox, puts the email into the sent items. And uh, that's just also all just standard MAPI um, calls that it's actually doing. Um, 
I just had the uh, uh, the the page for this. We've also tried to uh, keep using well standard open source practices, and we've always done that in our previous products. So we haven't just added that. Should be quite complete in all the man pages. All this help information should all be quite. Uh, 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 quite full and complete, so you won't find any strange binaries which don't tell you what they're doing or anything like that. Um, also, the RPMs that you install when you download Serafa really only contain these binaries. We don't install a huge management interface. We don't install a Java virtual machine. We don't install Tomcat or anything like that. It's really just these binaries, the server, uh, whatever configuration files you need. So if you already have a server and you want to upgrade or you want to start using Serafa, it's just adding this putting in the D agent and uh, adding the, uh, starting up the spooler should be enough to, uh, to get you up and running. Also, this has lots of options so that you can deliver stuff into people's junk mail folders and things like that. So if you want to integrate it with proc mail or things like that, it's quite easy to, uh, to use the minus J option up here, uh, which uh, delivers an email into your junk mail folder instead of your inbox, for example. Or you can just drop it, whatever. It's the same as what, you're, what you'd normally do with proc mail. So, the web access here, just quickly uh, uh, go through, show you a few little things. We've got here, indeed, the, uh, the right-click stuff. We've got the calendar, uh, which you can also set to different, uh, uh, to different views with week and, uh, and day. Uh, you got, um, uh, basically, you've got drag and drop as well for your email, so you can take this email and drag it over here somewhere, put it in junk or something, things like that. So, it really feels like a real application here. Um, and as I said before, this is all GPL code. Um, and actually, the web access, maybe you've seen in the URL already, is programmed in PHP and, of course, JavaScript for the browser side. So uh, a lot of developers can really quite easily just roll into using that. So who's using Zerof at the moment? At the moment, well, mainly they're ex-MS Exchange users uh, or people who wanted to go to MS Exchange but found this as an uh, alternative. Um, the reason is that we support all those major ex exchange features, like uh, the mobile synchronization stuff, and it also allows you to offer an MS-like feature to your, to your whatever your customer or to your company or your friends. Um, you can give them an MS-like experience, so it doesn't really matter for them. Where well, at the same time, you can keep using VI and edit all the files in the, in the Linux prompt and do everything like you used to uh, with PAMSAS and all these tools that you that you just yeah, already uh, uh, we're using. It runs on really large installs. We've got over a thousand concurrent users, uh, large databases, 200 gigs, very highly optimized, as I said before. Um, even the guys from MySQL asked us how we got it so quick instead of the other way around. Um, and it's used in really a lot of organizations from really small five user installs to up to a couple of thousand at the moment. And that's mainly in Europe, actually. And that's Again, because we're a Dutch company and we're mainly focused on, on Western Europe at the moment. So what's all this mappy stuff? I've already talked a little bit about it. Uh, it's a C++ object model, so uh, the, the native API is a C++ API. Um, it was originally developed by Microsoft. We basically took their API and implemented it ourselves. Um, by the way, it's just an open API, so you can find all the documentation on it on the internet. Um, and it combines basically all groupware items, and I mean by groupware items, I mean all the stuff we've been talking about, like email and calendaring, all into a single data model. Um, then what's the difference with IMAP? Well, everything. As I said before, MAPI is not a protocol. It's our own protocol, whereas IMAP's a real protocol. Um, MAPI works on lots of groupware types of items, whereas IMAP's really been made for email. Um, basically, there's there's no real uh, uh, similarity between the two. And do not ask me, can you make an IMAP backend for Zorafa? Because the answer is no. And we've had that question a lot. So why do all this work to use MAPI? It's all compatibility. It's just so that you're compatible with our other MAPI products and with, obviously, the MS products. So as a quick introduction, uh, going a little deeper now, uh, what does this interface look like? Um, there's quite a large interface. I've just put a little bit on this sheet to give you a little idea of what it looks like. Basically, you've got an object called an iMessage store. That is a big store of data. And basically, that's what you see in your web access as being this thing. This is a store. 
Um, that has a couple of functions. For example, you can say get properties, or get props is actually called. And for example, you can get data like what's the name uh, uh, of, this, uh, of this store, or you can get the size and things like that. You've also got get receive folder, for example. It gives you an, uh, an entry identifier for uh, a default folder like your inbox. And it has open entry so that you can open other objects like IMAPI folders. Logically enough, those are just the folders that you see in your, uh, in your store. Each of these folders, again, has get props, get contents table, which is then the table that you can see in your, uh, in your client normally with all the, well, the table data of the inbox, so which data is in the inbox. Actually, summary information. And again, open entry so that I can open the emails in those folders. And that's an iMessage. Has the same interface again with get props. You can just basically get properties of the messages. And then it has, again, it has attachments. And under this attachments can be messages again. So um, that's what you, for example, you've got a get attachment table. And if you're sending an email, you can call submit. Now, just to give you another quick idea of what that then looks like, um, actually, the best way to do this is through Outlook. I'm sorry for that. But um, Outlook has a nice little debug bar at the top. And it gives you an idea of what, what this stuff looks like. For example, if I open the folder, it actually um, shows a graphic um, yeah, uh, a graphic representation of the API. And you can see up here, maybe it's small, but it says get props here. No, it's not that small. Uh, it says get props here, and then these are all the properties on this email. Now, you can see there's quite a lot. And this was a really simple email. Uh, one of them was, for example, is down here. Oh, sorry, this was the folder. Yeah, so uh, we're looking at display name. PR display name is inbox. And that's actually just the name of the folder. All of the other properties are usually quite internal things. They're all important, but they're not that easy to explain at the moment. Same thing for an email. The email just has properties as well. It's just a collection of, uh, of properties. They all have different types. Um, and in this case, the body has, uh, let's take the subject. <laughs> The subject is test, blah, 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 well, some test email that we delivered. Um, so you can see just this is the API that you'd normally use to get all the data from the, uh, uh, from the message. Now you can imagine going from this data structure back to RFC 822 to your, to your Thunderbird client is quite a lot of work because you have to thread everything back together, do all the encoding and all the, all the, all the conversions and things like that, even char set conversions. So it's not that easy. Um, but you don't have to think about that because we do that in a couple of libraries that we also uh, provide. So that's the API. Um, well, quick overview. But it also has delivery rules. It has replication mechanism, server to server. Uh, we have an offline system, for example, which uses this replication. It has a security API. It has HTML plain text conversion stuff. It has advanced searching, so you can make a huge query tree and run a search. These are even live searches, so they update. As soon as an email arrives, the search results automatically update, things like that. Uh, it has full text searching. It has address book functions. And one that I didn't put here is that it has real-time notifications. Um, as I demonstrated before, when I delivered the email, you got a direct notification of you've got a new email. And that's also part of MAPI that you can push notifications to the client. So ways to develop with Serafa, since this is a developer's conference, um, I thought I'd just put these down on a, uh, on a list. Uh, well, obviously, with C++, you can uh, um, basically write entire applications. You could theoretically rewrite the entire Outlook, uh, well, UI, basically, because uh, that's all Outlook really is. It's just an UI on the, on the API. Uh, you can write that in C++ uh, in, in, in Linux, but you can even then run it on Windows because it's the same API. It's all source compatible, so if it compiles on Windows, it'll compile with Serafa on Linux as well. Except, of course, if you're using lots of stuff like MFC and things that are only, only exist on Windows. But, for example, you could make a Qt application in C++ and, and have it cross-platform compiled on Linux and on Windows. Um, obviously, C++, uh, easy to make lots of other language bindings um, with Swig or something like that. It uh, should be quite easy to have any language that you want also wrapped, I don't know, Ruby or something, Python. Uh, but the ones that we deliver at the moment is PHP, uh, makes really nice little simple scripts, and it also makes our entire web access. So also that's a quite comprehensive uh, API there. Uh, we haven't exposed the entire MAPI API through PHP, but almost everything that you're going to need uh, for, for, for scripting. 
Um, Perl is the entire API, but currently, as I said, it's only in the source distribution. If you want to play with it, you can just download the source distribution and, uh, and use that. Um, and then, last, lastly, the Web Access Plugin Framework. I'm going to show you a little bit about that, what that looks like. We can make little plugins for the Web Access, and, and, uh, or big plugins even. And uh, they integrate then with the, uh, with the AJAX Web Access. Now, just to go through, uh, uh, just to give you a quick idea, are there any C++ developers here? One, two, okay, that's enough. <laughs> I'll just give you an idea of what the C++ looks, look, looks like. Um, what shall I take? Uh, my space bar is broken, I think, so sometimes it doesn't space. Uh, bear with me. Uh, here's a nice one. Don't laugh at me, I use Joe for our editor. <laughs> um, now it looks quite Windows y uh, because of all the capitals. But uh, yeah. <laughs> So lots of capitals there. Uh, just, I'm just going to walk through this. What, what this code actually does? I think it actually opens your inbox and just dumps the dumps the uh, the inbox contents or something like that. First thing you always do is map you initialize. That's that's just a mappy standard. Um, we've got a convenience function here where you can just open a session directly. You can just say, I'm this username, this password, and it'll open your session for you. In this case, there's no error check. Oh, yes, there is. Um, you can specify it on the command line with this test program. But that'll, that'll give you a session that's your starting point. Uh, once you're logged in, um, you'll have a session object which you can use. Uh, on the session object, I have to open my default store. There's not just one store. There's, there can be lots of stores. Firstly, there's my store. There may be a public store. I may have opened somebody else's extra store. So, for example, if I'm looking in somebody else's calendar or somebody else's store because I have rights to look on his store, um, then you can have multiple ones. So there's another convenience function there that just opens the default one. And this LP store thing is, what is the IMSG store that I was talking about earlier. So that's the main object. Then we're calling get receive folder. Um, this is a kind of strange function in which Microsoft apparently at first thought, hey, wouldn't it be great if we had this function where you can uh, give it a string of the type of, the type of object that you want the default folder for, and then we'll give you the correct folder. And then, well, apparently they never used it because all this, this function ever does ever is in return your inbox. So <laughs> uh, not sure exactly what the idea was there, but yes, theoretically you could use it for, for things like uh, tell me what the default calendar folder is, but there's different mechanisms to do that. So. So then uh, what we get back is, a, is an entry ID, which is just a, a blob of bytes. And you really shouldn't see anything into these uh, blobs of bytes. They're just entry identifiers, mainly random, large, global, unique identifiers. So now we've got that. We've got the entry ID, so we can open it. And the open is happening here, where it's just opening uh, this entry ID. And what you get back, I just have to scroll to the end of the line here. What you get back here is an, uh, an Inbox, which is one of those IMAPI folders that I was talking about earlier. Then we have the folder. We do get contents table. We get a MAPI table. Yeah, the cost is there because, um, because I want to access it as uh, this function can return lots of different kinds of uh, IMAP, a MAPI object because it may return a folder, but you could have directly opened an, a message, so you would have gotten an iMessage. So that's the, that's the cost. Um, so I'm opening the table here. Uh, then you're saying, which columns do you want? And you're, so you're saying, I want subject uh, from to, I don't know, that, that kind of stuff. Then you're saying, give me the rows. And then I think we're not even outputting them, but <laughs> just freeing the data directly. Well, there should have been a printf in there somewhere, probably uh, outputting some inf in interesting information. This whole memory management thing, I won't go into that now. I don't have any time for that. But uh, yeah, this is just a simple program that just opens your inbox and dumps the, uh, dumps the contents. Now, if we have a look at the, the same program in PHP, um, I think I put it here somewhere. Yes. Um, now, PHP, of course, um, normally, well, uh, natively is not an object-oriented system. Don't kill me now, people saying, yes, it is. Well, not if you're exporting C functions. <laughs> um, oh, the red is not very readable, is it? Uh, so basically, we've changed everything to, into a, a non-object-oriented uh, API in which you just pass the object as the first parameter. That's what C++ does anyway. <laughs> um, 
so we're just passing the, uh, the, the object as the first parameter and then the rest is the same because we're opening uh, a session here. Uh, then we're looking for the default store. We're doing that here by hand. Then we're opening the store. Then we're doing this get receive folder function again. It's exactly the same as we were doing before. Then we're doing get contents table. Then we're doing query rows. And then we're dumping all the subjects. And just to show you that that works, and I know that went really quickly, but I don't have that much time. If I run this now, you get a dump of all the, all the subjects in your inbox. Now you can do some already quite handy things with this. For example, if you want to do rule stuff, uh, you can just make a little PHP script that looks for emails with a certain subject and moves them all somewhere else. Or you can make a little um, script. I know that PHP isn't the best command line scripting language in the world, but you could theoretically make a little script that integrates with asterisk, for example, that each time you're called, that it puts in your calendar, oh, you were called by this number or something, I don't know. Things like that. Or even, even nicer, uh, that it looks in your calendar whether you're in a meeting, and if you are, it puts you to voicemail, things like that. So it's quite, it's, you can do a lot of cool stuff with this PHP stuff. I haven't seen that many contributions yet with this kind of uh, VoIP kind of integrations, but it should be, uh, should be quite easy. And myself, I really don't, uh, don't know anything about asterisk, so um, if anyone does, I'd love to see it. Um, what was the third one? Pearl, yeah, we won't go into that. What's the time? Yeah, um, the Web Access plugin framework. Uh, I'm just gonna wa walk through an existing plugin again. We're not gonna uh, write it from scratch. Um, as I said before, everything in the Web Access is PHP and JavaScript based. So um, usually you, for your module, you have a server side part and a client side part. And what, we're, what I'm gonna demonstrate in a quick uh, plugin here is uh, uh, one of those uh, cool, uh, if I hover over um, a, uh, an address that it will show the Google Maps, uh, a little map pop-up of that address. Um, what you basically do is, uh, so Rafa has a, uh, the uh, web access has a special plugins directory. Each directory that you put in here is, is a plugin. Sorry about that. So we've got two plugins here. We'll just look at test. And the most important thing here is the manifest. There's an XML file which uh, basically tells, uh, tells Zarafa what, what files are in here and what it should be doing. Um, and it has information in it. Uh, as you see, I didn't write this, but my colleague did. Um, but basically, the most important stuff is down here. I'll just highlight this so that the beamer shows nice. Yeah, that's a lot better, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. We'll do it like this. Huh? Hey, that worked. Uh, so down there, at the, the three things down here, the most important thing, this is client code that uh, should be included. It basically tells Rafa, these are important files, you need to include them. It doesn't do much else with them, it just says, tells the browser to load those files. So in this case, we have plugin test.js and we have test.css, a little CSS file. And uh, it also says that for the dialog, because we have separate dialog windows, you don't see that a lot, I must say. In, uh, when I double click an email, it actually opens a new window. We don't do these divs in, uh, in, inside the main window, we just open completely new windows. So you can set up which file should be included in which, uh, in which window system. So then, of course, the most interesting thing is the plugin test.js. And just to walk through this, hopefully not too quickly, but kind of quickly, uh, there's an initialization function there that's uh, started up as soon as the, uh, uh, the window is loaded. And then you can start registering uh, basically events. We've got a huge list of events where you can hook into. And a couple of the ones are here are pre-display, post-display. Um, that's pre and post-display of the HTML, um, I think. Yes, the HTML body of the email. So it's set body, pre-display, and post-display. Um, if we have a look at what that then does, once you've registered them, you should have an execute function. Just basically ev everything comes through execute, uh, just to have, so that we have one entry point, and then we just have a big switch there, so we switch our, uh, our uh, uh, registered uh, uh, events. One of them is then pre-display. We'll go and have a look at that one. It basically removes some commented stuff. All it does is some magic regular expression replace, which doesn't completely work, but normally does for a test plugin. Um, it replaces basically an address, which it currently uh, detects by just looking at commas and, and things that look like postal codes and things like that. 
or is it only spaces? Yeah, it's not that smart anyway. And then it replaces that with uh, a link so that you can actually make a link out of that, uh, uh, out of that address. So it does that before displaying it, and then after it's displayed it, it actually adds the events from the, from the JavaScript into the, uh, into the link so that you can actually do stuff with that link. So that's all that it does. Um, I won't go into the rest of the, the code because all it, that really does is just Gmail, Gmap code stuff, which basically uh, brings up the little, uh, um, uh, sorry, not Gmail, uh, Google Maps uh, code. So, quick demonstration. Need to deliver an email with something that looks like a, uh, an address. What were we, user 999? Subject, a map test. Hello, my address is, I'm just gonna do our company address in the Netherlands. I think it has to have four parts, so. Beep. So we'll just load that up. And then yay, it is a link now. Oh, I should have showed that it wasn't a link otherwise, but anyway. Um, and it does this cool uh, map thing. So yeah, it's probably with only a couple of hundred lines of code, you've got a cool little uh, plug in there and you can make make basically everything with this, uh, with this uh, system because you have full control of the entire system. Um, that means that you can do everything. It also means that you can break everything. So uh, <laughs> that's the problem with these kind of extension systems. But it's basically the same as in Firefox. You can make weird extensions that break everything in Firefox as well. It's the same idea. You can just uh, hook into everything and change stuff. So uh, that's the idea there. Uh, this actually will be in the next released version, which is 6.30. And we were releasing that on Friday, but there was a bug, so we're now releasing it sometime next week. Just one bug. Yeah, just one, yeah, yeah. Well, there was one bug that we thought, wow, this is really, yeah, you don't want that. I think that was an upgrade problem. Uh, so it wouldn't have even been bad for you guys, probably. Um, let's see, uh, yeah. That's all for the, uh, for the Web Access Plugin Framework. If you want to see more, uh, the beta's coming. We're going to be posting lots of information on our wiki. Uh, we have a nice uh, 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 wiki page with lots of technical stuff, and we'll post all the documentation up here with uh, all, the, uh, all the hooks that you can use and all the information that you need to create your own plugins for, for this Rafa Web Access. A uh, few more sheets. Some projects that are, some of them are ours. Zpush is the Active Sync protocol implementation that I was talking about. You can actually also use that without Serafa. It has a, an IMAP backend, so on one side it talks IMAP, on the other side it talks Active Sync. And you can use that to synchronize your pocket PC or your iPhone. So, um, of course, you could just use IMAP, which is basically the same, but uh, you can also make other backends, for example, if you wanna use a different, uh, a different synchronization. You wanna synchronize, I don't know, your uh, your V cards in a directory somewhere, you could use that as well. Um, Zmerge is a different project from us, which is served server replication. We use that for sugar CRM to Zorafa synchronization. That means that uh, you can quite easily uh, couple objects uh, or emails, for example, and send them to, to a sugar CRM or import them back into, into Zorafa. And that's all server-side uh, uh, synchronized, so that means also that if I have a task in my tasks folder in Outlook and I press on done, it will directly send that down to your Sugar CRM system and also mark it as done there. And if that task was a shared task, then it'll even mark it done for all the other users that also had that same uh, shared task. Um, so that said, merge, that's actually a, a, a merging platform. It's also open source. Um, OpenMappy.org is actually not ours, but for, uh, is something that we participate in, which is a, uh, uh, basically aims to be yeah, a source of information on, on, on Mappy, but also they, uh, they're backed by a couple of companies that all make open source uh, Mappy uh, stuff. Uh, last one I put down there is just because I made it. I made a small uh, uh, InnoDB for MySQL statistics and recovery program. Um, it's, uh, it, sometimes recovers your data when you can't get anything from MySQL anymore. Um, but it also does some cool statistics which you normally can't get from MySQL. So take a look at that if, you, if you're interested. Um, it's a, a fun little project. So, I think nicely in time for questions.
Next week. No, actually, it has been implemented, but it's in the version that we're releasing next week. So uh, we used to have uh, iCalendar only. Um, iCalendar is, yeah, the, downloading your, your whole calendar with 5,000 items in it as iCalendar and then deleting one and sending 3,999 back is, yeah, not really a great way to work. So we disabled write support in, the, in that old version, which only had iCalendar. And now we've gone to CalDAV, and so you can really do single objects. You can do reports, well, the real CalDAV stuff, um, which you can hear about after this, I think. So. Yeah. Yeah, so downloading contacts in, th in, in Thunderbird, I really have no idea because what is the protocol that Thunderbird uses for that? Use LDAP. LDAP, okay. Yeah, I understand. So they have. You want to be able to uh, to download those from in, in Thunderbird, yeah. I'd really have to look into that because that sounds like we'd have to do something. Obviously, if you're already using an LDAP server as a, as a backend, there's not much point in us making anything because you might as well just query the LDAP server directly. Um, but I can imagine, oh, I see, yeah, the contacts that you've made in MAPI, yeah, that would that would entail us making some kind of LDAP server which proxies your map, uh, MAPI data, yeah. Um, not on the roadmap at the moment, so I, I wouldn't expect that, at least from us, really soon. But uh, yeah, uh, use the source, you can make it. Okay, noted. Yeah, so the question. Thunderbird was a very specific question. Yeah. If you say, well, there's this other open source project which is more suitable to replacing Outlook, what, what Yeah, so the, the question was here uh, what client can we actually use open source wise uh, if we don't want to use Thunderbird or something like that? Well, my opinion is that currently the, pro the problem is that. Uh, of course, Thunderbird is nice um, for, for email, and if you combine it, then it's indeed with some of these features. They're using different protocols for all these different things. So uh, you can put in Lightning and do the calendaring stuff uh, as well and, and use CalDAV there. Um, I think the problem is there that there's not one... Uh, uh, if you're using all these different protocols and different server systems, they're, never, they're not really cup coupled. It would be really nice, and that's... Uh, a thing that we, we could theoretically do, is create a completely new client based on MAPI, um, which can do all the, all the Outlook stuff. Uh, unfortunately, or not unfortunately, but we just simply haven't chosen to do that yet because most people think the, uh, the, the web access work, works fine because, of course, that's an option saying, why don't we just go to web technologies? They're getting faster and faster and better and better anyway. So what is there that we can't do in the web access that we can do in a real application? Now, obviously, there's quite a few things, but you could also look at... Uh, 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 using more uh, more of an application platform like Prism or things like that to really uh, really make it application like and have drag and drop and all these cool features and that would be really great but also something that we we, we have 15 developers uh, unfortunately we don't have that on the roadmap at the moment um, so um, yeah lots of people here so should we go over here okay here first I knew I'd get this question, and you told me to take the sheet out. Yeah. Uh, so the question was. I saw their presentation at the NLUUG. Yeah. Oh yeah, he was there as well. Yeah. Uh, um, so the question is, uh, the Samba guys are doing something with uh, with Exchange, and that project's called Open Change. Um, I've actually spoken to one of the a couple of one of the developers here. We were talking about how we can do stuff with Serafa there because what they've done is actually the op the opposite of what we've done is basically take this wire protocol from Exchange and basically do what Samba does and um, protocol anal analysis it. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> they didn't reverse engineer it. Not allowed to say that. They did protocol analysis on that. <laughs> And uh, so that's, that's what they did now again with Exchange. And the reason for that is that the Exchange RPC, which is how, what they call it, um, uh, looks a lot like all the Samba stuff because it's based on the same RPC uh, uh, code base. And a lot of stuff around it and 
Yeah, the problem is, so they, they, they have this quite well working. Um, uh, they also have uh, an evolution plugin so that you can talk directly to Exchange. I think that's semi-releasable sometime soon. But they have nothing on the server side. And that's one of the things that, that we were talking about yesterday. Um, since we already have a database with a mappy structure, it would theoretically be possible to take the Exchange wire protocol and use our backend. But that said, uh, I know there will be really problems there. <laughs> um, the, uh, there's no one-in-one -one mapping between the Exchange RPC protocol and our database. We probably have to do some conversions and things like that. And then is the question is, why do you want to do that? Um, I think the main reason why you want to do that is that you don't have to install something extra on your Windows machine, um, which is a yeah, fairly minor plus, I'd say. But, so. Next question. Person in the back. Sorry, I don't understand. Uh, I, I missed half of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to watch out because there's two active syncs. Uh, one active sync is the active sync that you run on your computer, and then you put your USB cable in, and then you synchronize, and then yay. Um, uh, the other active sync is what they call server active sync, and that is actually a protocol between your PDA and the Exchange server. So Outlook has nothing to do with the protocol that the PDA talks to the Exchange server to. And that's what you want because you want this over the air synchronization. That's the difference. Yeah, Daniel? Uh, do we have real, like, widespread uh, deployment of, of the servers? Yeah, do we have wide, widespread deployment of the servers? Uh, some, Ah, synchronize each other. Oh. Do you use RPC over web? Web RPC that Outlook currently use with Exchange, where you can okay. Web, uh, basically web HTTP protocol. Yeah, I understand. Oh. <laughs> you think I know the first one when you're finished? <laughs> anyway, yeah. And do you use on the, on, on the server, do you use MAPI interfaces to basically to connect to the server? Or what is the yeah. communication? Okay, so the first, we'll go for the first question first. That is, uh, or should we go for the, no. Uh, first question first. That was, uh, do we do replication between servers which are a long way apart? No. Currently we don't do uh, server to server replication. Uh, on the server side, we're looking at doing that. We actually have a developer working on that kind of stuff at the moment. Uh, the reason is because if you're doing clustering, the normal clustering way in, uh, in, in MAPI setups, aka Exchange, um, is that you basically have five servers and you, you basically uh, spread your users over those five servers. So you say user number one is there, user number two is there, and user three is there. Uh, so there's no replication there. Uh, so we're looking at whether we can have some kind of replication system there. But that's, uh, I'd say, probably talking end of the year this year. Second question I can't remember anymore. The third question was about whether we use uh, uh, MAPI on the server uh, for the AJAX. And uh, that's totally true. Um, we do use that. Um, no, I'll just tell it, otherwise it'll take too long. Um, the PHP language binding that I was just talking about is just talking to the MAPI client. The MAPI client talks over the network to the MAPI server. So you could theoretically have your Apache server on one server, Zorafo on the other server, or not theoretically, lots of people do this. Apache on one server, Zorafo on the other server, and it will just use the standard MAPI calls that you, you'd use otherwise also over the network. So that's all splittable uh, between everything. The second question was? Oh yeah, uh, there's this thing that Microsoft calls uh, RPC over HTTP or RP RPC over something like that. Well, that's nothing else than that it's this wire protocol encapsulated in an, in an, uh, in an HTTP call. So no, we don't do anything with that because we don't do anything with their protocol. So, uh, next question, yeah. Sorry, the what of an email? Just uh, the, the making of an email, when you type an email, that dialog box, can you call that directly from uh, Windows program? In the web, the web access one, you mean? 
the question is, can I uh, open the, uh, the Compose email dialog directly from, uh, do you mean from a Windows program or from a desktop application program? Uh, yeah, so whether you can uh, open a new mail link, yes, you can because we also have mail2 support, so when you have a link with mail2 colon blah -de blah if you click on that in your browser, uh, we have a feature that you, you have to play around with some settings in your, in your operating system, whether it's Windows or Linux, uh, but if you do that, um, you can send a specific URL request to the web access and it will open a new, it will only open a new uh, email dialog. So yeah, you should be able to do that simply by opening the correct URL. So, I, I don't really know which one, but <laughs> you, ca you can, I think, on the website, uh, on our community page. Um, down here at the bottom somewhere. No, it's not, yet. No, it's not there, okay. It's, uh, we have it somewhere, but we don't know where. So, <laughs> if you look into the source, you'll probably quite easily find what the mail to uh, link thing is. So, and otherwise, it'll be on the website soon. Okay. So, last question, I think. Last question. Last question. Unless there's none, you've been already. You can ask later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's quite easy. We, we're, we're basically a company. Uh, uh, we've been uh, a company doing this product since 2000. Four, and uh, basically uh, we live off the the license income. If we if we make it completely open source, we'll miss the license income. Um, we'd like to. Um, we're looking at we're going more direction of a service oriented company, and we'd like to make everything open source. But currently we just we can't just suddenly do that. And uh, I think it's uh, I see it as a bit of a more long term project. We made most of it open source last September. We had already had had some open source projects before that. Now we made most open source and I'm, I'm guessing the rest will come as well. <laughs>